Welcome. Since you found this video, I suppose that you're already familiar with the Roman poet Publius Ovidius Naso, or briefly Ovid and his work. And if you're not, I suggest that you check out the channel of my friend Oli Wu. He has a music video which offers a fresh interpretation of Ovid's poem on Daedalus and Icarus. And in the music video, you can hear my voice in the background, and there's even a few seconds of footage where you can see me struggling to scan the Latin hexameters correctly and to keep up with the beat at the same time. For this video, the story of Daedalus and Icarus and Ovid's poem based on this ancient story is of interest only in so far as Ovid begins with a few verses evoking the desperation of Daedalus at his exile in Crete and his longing to go back to his native Athens. And we'll focus in this video on the events which forced Ovid himself to go into exile only a few years after his metamorphoses with the story of Daedalus and Icarus were written. So this video is about the crimes of Ovid and the punishment he received for those alleged crimes. I implied already that Ovidius was forced to leave Rome and go into exile as a punishment for crimes that he supposedly committed. I hope that you, like me, are interested to know a little more about what precisely happened to Ovidius. So first and foremost, what crimes did he actually commit? Secondly, how was he tried? Which court convicted him? And finally, what precisely was his punishment? Of these questions, the third one can be answered relatively easily, while the first one is the most tricky one, and so I'll change around the order of these three questions. I'll start with the question, how was Ovidius punished? We know already that Ovidius was forced to leave Rome and go into exile. At the time when Ovidius lived, at the end of the Roman Republic and at the beginning of the Roman Empire under the first Emperor Augustus, this was a novel form of punishment. In the earlier times of the Roman Republic, there was no penalty of exile. There was the death penalty. And if the condemned person was a member of the upper strata of society, a senator or a rich man, then it was customary not to execute that person, but to secretly allow him to leave the country before execution. And once such a person, a convicted criminal, had left the city of Rome, it was then publicly declared that he would lose his citizenship, that he would lose all his property, and that he would be forbidden to ever return to Rome. So for the members of the upper strata of Roman society, the death penalty didn't actually mean execution, but it meant exile for life. And at the end of the Republic and in the early days of the empire, there were the first laws which explicitly provided for exile as a legal punishment. Now, the punishment of Ovidius was a bit different from the traditional exile, because if you were condemned to death and allowed to flee Rome as a, a rich member of society in the Republican times, you were basically free to go wherever you pleased or wherever you could count on some sort of support. Ovidius, in turn, was forced to go to a certain place. He was ordered to spend the rest of his life in Tomi or Tomoi, at the coast of the Black Sea. Now this is a remote place. You can see the ship slowly making the voyage from Rome to Tommy. In ancient times this would have taken roughly 35 days. So it was really a remote place far away from the center of the world, far away from the center of Ovidius's world. So in that sense his punishment was even harsher than the punishment of the exiles in Republican times. On the other hand, he was 
allowed to keep his citizenship, he was allowed to keep his property, he tells us so in his poetry, but still he's complaining all the time about his exile. Tomi is modern-day Constanza in Romania, and it seems that Tomi was and Constanza is a nice enough place in summer. It's at the coast, as you can see. But the winters are very harsh. The average temperature is much lower than in Rome. So in addition to being far away from the center of events, he was in a relatively unpleasant place. Now, who did this to Ovidius? Which court tried and convicted him and sent him into exile? The standard form of criminal procedure at the times of Ovidius was trial by jury. Perhaps this is surprising for some of you. The Romans already invented the jury trial as it is practiced today in English and US courts. The number of jurors was relatively high. A criminal jury comprised 50 to 70 people. And it was a hotly debated question during the times of the Roman Republic, who was allowed to sit as a juror in a so-called quaestio. Most of the time, only senators were allowed to act as jurors, but during some phases of Roman history, members of other social classes were also allowed to sit on a criminal jury. So there were 50 plus judges and a presiding judge who conducted proceedings was, but was not allowed to vote. And this procedure, of course, would inspire some degree of faith in the propriety of the proceedings and in the justice of the sentence. But Ovidius explicitly tells us that he was not convicted by a questio, that he was not convicted by selected judges, as would have been the case had this standard procedure applied to his case. And he also tells us that he was not convicted by the Senate. Now, the Senate did not usually act as a criminal court, but it did so act in certain high profile political cases. So we don't know yet what Ovidius crime was, but at the very least, he tells us he was not convicted by the Senate either. He tells us in his own words that it was the emperor himself who condemned him. Now, the fact that Augustus acted as a judge in this case was perhaps less shocking to the Romans than it is to us. Augustus at this time had seized power in Rome and it was almost self-evident that this would also entail supreme power over the judicial system. There was no notion of separation of power at this time and Augustus was in the process of replacing the old jury system with a new court system where the emperor himself or officials appointed by the emperor would act as judge and jury. And one of the reasons why this was done and why it was accepted by the population was that the procedure in the old courts was quite clumsy. But of course, it does not inspire faith in the propriety of proceedings in us that Augustus was acting as a judge and also was the injured party in the case, because that's what Ovidius tells us in these verses. He tells us that it was not the Senate nor a jury who convicted him. It was the prince himself who took his revenge, that's what Ovidius tells us, for offenses against himself. And this brings us to the all important question, what were Ovidius's crimes? What was he condemned and sent into exile for? Now, all that we know about this question comes from Ovid's own poetry, from the poems he wrote while in exile. And they're not particularly clear about this. What Ovid tells us is that there were two reasons for his sentence, Carmen et Error, a poem and a mistake. Most scholars agree that the poem, which was one of the causes of his troubles, was his Ars Amatoria, his Art of Love, which had actually been published a couple of years before he was sent into exile. It was 
a very comprehensive guide to the art of love, which included recommendations for sex positions. And so it seems that for the Emperor Augustus, this was simply too much. Augustus had very strict views about sexual morality and had enacted laws against what he perceived as illicit sexual behavior. And so it is quite plausible that he was offended by Ovid's graphic poem. It is much less clear what the mistake may have been. And scholars have developed all sorts of theories about what kind of mistake Ovidius made. And since Ovidius was a poet, and since poets always stir the romantic imagination of people, it has been suggested he had an affair, perhaps with a high-ranking member of the imperial family. There are at least two candidates for this. One is the emperor's daughter, Julia the Elder. You can see her portrait here. But she had been banished herself many years before Ovidius, so it seems unlikely that he was banished for having an affair with her. There's also her daughter, the Empress' granddaughter, also named Julia, Julia the Younger, who was banished for acts of adultery at the same time when Ovidius was banished. But we have a list of her alleged lovers, and we know that all those on the list were punished much more leniently than Ovidius, so it would be surprising if Ovidius was the only one punished with perpetual exile. Plus, he's on none of these lists, so it's a mere speculation that he might be another one of Julia's lovers. We know nothing about it, so this theory, too, is not too likely. Ovid himself likens his actions to those of Acteon, the famous hunter who watched the goddess Diana bathing nakedly and who, as a punishment, was transformed by Diana into a deer and then killed by his own dogs. So it has been suggested that perhaps Ovidius too saw something inappropriate. And again, the idea is that maybe he saw the emperor himself or his wife engaging in some sort of illicit sexual conduct, perhaps meeting an extramarital lover. But again, there is no real trace of this in the sources. Plus, if this was really the reason why Ovidius was condemned, he probably wouldn't have mentioned it in his poems, which were meant to um, persuade the emperor to let him return, so he wouldn't have reminded him of an episode like this. There's also the idea that perhaps he intruded on some sort of religious ritual. He wrote a poem on the Roman festivals, and it could be that uh, during the, his research for these poems, he spied on some sort of ritual where men were not allowed, but again this is pure speculation. The most likely theory is actually that he knew about a conspiracy against the emperor. There is reason to believe that Julia was not only an adulterer, but that she was also involved in a conspiracy against the emperor and his designated successor Tiberius. And it could be that Ovidius somehow knew about this conspiracy and that this is the reason why he was condemned and sent into exile, that he knew about this conspiracy and didn't let the authorities know. This would be in keeping with what he tells us himself, and there are at least some traces in the sources suggesting that there was such a conspiracy. So what would this mean in terms of Roman criminal law? First, there are the accusations stemming from Ovid's book, his Ars Amatoria, or his Art of Love. It is likely that the publication of this book was seen as an act of instigation to adultery. In many modern legal systems, adultery is no longer a crime, but it was a punishable offense under legislation enacted by Emperor Augustus himself, the so-called Lex Julia de Adulteris Coercendis. And while many modern lawyers would be hard-pressed to find that the publication of a book with advice in sexual matters constituted an act of instigation to adultery, we can at least say that 
the charge under this law was not completely without legal basis. And then secondly, we assume, as we have said, that Ovid knew something about a conspiracy against the emperor. Now, all attacks on the imperial government or on the person of the emperor were regarded as acts of high treason or acts of the crime of majesty, the crimen majestatis. The boundaries of this crime were extremely vague, but again, we can at least say that probably the charges against Ovid were not completely without legal basis. It is also likely that both the statute against adultery and the statute on the crime of maestas provided for exile as the standard penalty. So also in that regard, it seems that while the proceedings against Ovid conducted by the emperor as the injured party himself were somewhat irregular, they were not completely outside the law as it stood at the time. And that brings us to the end of this short video. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel Use Romanum and hit the like button. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.